వెల్కమ్ టు ఈపీజీ పాఠశాల ఐఎమ్ డాక్టర్ టి సాయి చంద్రమౌళి ఫార్మర్ అసోసియేట్ ప్రొఫెసర్ ఆఫ్ ఇంగ్లీష్ రైల్వే కాలేజ్ ఉస్మానియా యూనివర్సిటీ హైదరాబాద్ మాడ్యూల్ థర్టీ వన్ ఆన్ థామస్ కార్లైల్ ఇస్ రిటర్న్ బై డాక్టర్ నీతా నగాయిజ్ థామస్ కార్లైల్ విజ్ ఎ నైన్టీన్ సెంచురీ స్కాటిష్ ఎస్ఐస్ట్ హిస్టోరియన్ అండ్ సటైరికల్ రైటర్ He is known widely for his works like Sarathar Rasathiyas and the French Revolution. He was born on December 4th in the year 1795 in Eclefechan in the Galloway region of Scotland. Carlyle's philosophies were greatly influenced by his father who was a, a stern Calvinist. Calvinists are those who who believed that people are saved through God's grace and not through their own merits. Carlyle joined the University of Edinburgh in his teens in the year 1809 with the intention of becoming a minister. That is, he wanted to join the church and conduct service, but instead chose to explore mathematics and teaching as a career. This too did not satisfy him and he finally settled down to become a full-time writer. Carlyle was very well read and had a penchant for languages and learnt many languages through his life like French, Latin, Greek, German, Italian, Spanish, Danish, etc. He made consistent use of the Bible in his writings and combined with his knowledge of languages, his prose, which is a bit difficult to understand. He was interested in the philosophy of German writers, particularly in the works of Kant, Hegel, Novalis, Gatha, Fitch, Schleling, Schlegel and Richter. And in the mid 1820s he translated Gotha's novel Wilhelm Meister's apprenticeship into English. In 1826 he married Jane Welsh, a fellow literary enthusiast of his time. The marriage was not a healthy one but they remained married nearly for 40 years till she departed. Carlyle spent the last years of his life mourning his wife and he died on 5th February 1881 in London. He was buried in Scotland where his parents also were rested. Among his early works we may mention his translation of Gatha's Wilhelm Meister's apprenticeship as a notable one, remarkable work indeed. Essays on German literature impressed, inspired and interested him and he wanted the British to look at German literature and philosophy and change their views and attitudes so prevalent in the Victorian age. Essays on German literature impressed him, infatuated him and he was guided by the cardinal principles contained in them. Essays and commentaries on modern culture also is a major contribution of Thomas Carlyle. Among his famous essays we may mention Signs of Time, Characteristics on Heroes, Hero Worship, The Hero in His in History. Among his famous essays we may mention Sartor Rusartius and the French Revolution as is a major contribution in enriching English literature, more so prose works. Among his later works, his essays on uh, the letters and speeches of Oliver Cromwell published in 1845, Occasional Discourse on the Negro Question published in 1849, 
Shooting Niagara and After, written in three volumes, published in 1867, may be mentioned as a noteworthy works of Thomas Carlyle. The Early Kings of Norway, the portraits of uh, John Knox also are creditable works by him. Sartor Resartius, The Life and Opinions of Herr Theoflex Drock by Thomas Carlyle continues to enthrall his admirers even today. Carlyle wrote Sartor Resartius as a novel which he used as a mouthpiece to speak out his criticism on the materialism and the philosophical rationalism of his time. It is an indirect elucidation of a spiritual journey and a quest. In the novel, he uses a character, the Eugenese Theophilus Drock. The journey of his character, his life and commentary on his philosophy form the material of the book. Sartre Resartius is divided into three books of 11, 10 and 12 chapters. The title of the book means the tailor retailored. The novel is created by putting scraps of paper from diaries, journals, letters of Diogenes Theophilus Druck found and thrown randomly into a large laundry bag. This is why the novel has a disjointed and loose structure as well as plot. The evolution takes place in three chapter stages. The stage of negation followed by stage of indifference and finally the stage of affirmation concludes the book. It is a political satire on orthodoxy in society and religion and also on the quick growth of science and commerce in his uh, times. Carlyle wishes to express that the clothes referred to in the novel symbolize the world of matter which the spirit finds to shape, take shape, shape and manifest itself. It is upon man to make sense of the world, but the sense needs to be rectified. And according to Carlyle, it is distorted because of too many scientific explanations. Religious preaching and impaired institutional bodies also contribute to the disharmony in life and to the misery of man during his times. Sartre Resartius is a political satire on orthodoxy in society and religion and industrialization that affected the ethical and moral fabric of English society. Carlyle uses German philosophy to answer the question of faith in the English people. The novel was written in three separate parts of 11, 10 and 12 chapters. Sartre Resortius means tailor retailored as we mentioned earlier. Book 1 opens with the editor lamenting the current scientific worldview. The editor decides to translate the writings of a German philosopher into English. He also decides to learn about the life of philosopher Diogenes Theophilus Druck. Theophilus Druck's writings are found stuffed in six paper bags which the editor had to go through. The book opens with the views of an editor, the narrator in the book, who argues that the rational outlook has rendered the mysteries of creation to nothing and this rationalism does not take into account clothing within quotes which is the most important material for creation. The clothing is the social, political 
and religious entities which impair the vision of man and fail to show him the spiritual world. Chifalstrak was adopted by Andreas and Grishin. His name means God-born devil's dung in quotes. He undergoes many adventures which lead him to insignificance and despair. This despair becomes the starting point in the evolution of his philosophy. Book 3. The discussion in the book focuses on philosophy. The first few chapters take a review of history of clothing, styles and the importance of symbols contained therein. A symbolic worldview is necessary to see the higher truth. The book closes with chapter on the tailor who is like a creator. The editor adds his uh, remarks on the value of man like Chifalstrak. As one goes to the works of Carlyle, one understands that language brings logic and cognition to thought. It is the power to recall, hide or mislead intentions. Language is used to name things and the name is the symbol of conveyed message. Silence is advocated over speech. Silence helps only to deliver deep and get an idea of the divine. Chapter 7 in the second book is quite interesting. The author tries to trace the origin of despair and misery in man's life. Everlasting number is the spirit of unbelief in God. This unbelief is on account of mechanical way of thinking brought on by industrialization and loss of value in religion. Hopeless men and despair spring out of loss of faith and onset of doubt. The despair leads to a static state called center of indifference. In the same book, the papers reveal that Theophil's drug was found by Andreas and a Grishin Futural at their doorstep with his birth certificate on him. Here, the life of the child unfolds from infancy to adulthood. Theophil's drug reminisces that a name a person gets is the first garment and the second garment is the language he acquires from birth. The literal meaning of his uh, name is God born devil's dung. This name leads him to life and utter dissatisfaction with it. He goes out into the world and meets its many challenges and finds that the law fails to give him a purpose and he keeps looking for meaningful work and becomes a professor. This part of the book focuses on the philosophy of Theophilstrak. He reviews the various clothes men wear, clothes that hide the real man and reveal the way man wants to appear to other fellow beings, human beings. The clothes are also the myriad forms and appearance of the world under which is hidden the ultimate reality. To understand the man and uh, see his uh, true nature, the clothes he wears need to be stripped off, not literally but figuratively. Book 3 also deals with life. In life, if a man has to realize the presence of God, then he also has to fight the devil. The devil in the form of covering with clothes the reality within. The nature of the world can only be understood when the symbols around us give a glimpse of the higher truth and can be only found by the man who 
delves deep within. Satire pervades the entire chapters where Carlyle discusses the wearer of various clothes, the clothes which are peculiar to the profession the person takes up. He takes the metaphor of clothes to show how man uses them to cover his uh, naked state and also that he is not equated with uh, savages but uh, most of the time he gets so carried away with them that he fails to connect with his uh, inner being. Idea of clothes emerges powerfully, strongly, symbolically in this book. It's a, a pivot between that holds uh, the narration between the spirit of negation and spirit of affirmation. Second birth of Chifal's Drak, the spiritual birth happens in this stage. Chapter 9 in the second book deals with the way in which a change takes place in a man, his thinking and his life. Conversion from doubt to faith, negation becoming affirmation are dealt with in a very candid and interesting manner by Thomas Carlyle. Sense of hopelessness pervades this chapter, yet the author says man must seek blessedness and not happiness. We may talk about uh, the narrative technique adopted by Thomas Carlyle while writing this book. It's in the form of a novel. No doubt it is a philosophical treatise too. Historical and sociological study it is essentially. It deals with life and philosophy predominantly. There are two levels of narrative here in this book. One is biography of Chifal's Druck and second is editor's commentary on that. Technique used to create uh, is a, a sort of disorganized picture of a disorganized reality. As one goes through the book, one comes to understand the symbolic employment of uh, clothes by Thomas Carlyle. There is a great symbolic significance attached to what one wears. Nature is a living garment of God, one realizes. Different clothes symbolize the different professions one takes up, which is a part of our life and a, a part of uh, the way in which the society also expects us to live. Clothes create a barrier between appearance and reality. Body is a garment which clothes the soul. Soul is a truth, but body is illusion. That's what one has to understand as one goes through this book. One may say that uh, Thomas Carlyle started prophetic pattern of writing and he didn't bother about uh, either admiration or condemnation he was likely to receive from his uh, contemporary writers or uh, people around. The writers or great people who were impacted or influenced by his work include Charles Dickens, Alfred Tennyson, James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, Virginia Woolf to speak. Influence of his writing were on writers, politicians, scientists, great stories of his time. Cutting across all sections of the society, he did impact the people of his times. He translated German literature and philosophy into English. According to him, music is well said to be the speech of angels. Thomas Carlyle also opined that a strong mind always hopes and has always cause to hope. To quote Thomas Carlyle, we may say, I quote, A man willing to work and unable to find work is perhaps the saddest sight that fortune's inequality exhibits under the sun. Full stop, unquote. Thomas Carlyle is famous for his saying when he said, A loving heart is the beginning of all knowledge. To sum up, Thomas Carlyle did not look at industrialization in England and rapidity with which it was spreading in the country in a positive manner. He did not bother much about 
response of either his admirers or people who did not like his work or who did not appreciate his viewpoint. He urged the Englishman to look at Germany and draw inspiration by reading German philosophy and German literature. He was a, a spiritual, moral and ethical force for people to rally around and try to voice their views fearlessly, frankly, boldly during his times in Victorian England. Thank you for visiting Ipatashala. Namaste.